I'm Lisa Campbell, director of the Barry Center for the Arts. Welcome to another episode of Bringing Home Barry. Today, I'm joined by our Dean, Peter Campbell, for a fascinating conversation with some alumni on a project they worked on together entitled, Can't Get There From Here. So Peter, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about this project. Uh, why don't you start out by explaining the premise of the project for us? Uh, so Can't Get There From Here has a long origination story. The basic premise is that there are these letters uh, that were written in response to a want ad uh, by a local farmer and businessman in um, Brownsville, Pennsylvania, which is down the river from Pittsburgh. Uh, it was in the Pittsburgh uh, Post-Gazette, and it was looking for a wife. The reason that we know about this is because Cauldron then kept the letters that he received in response to the want ad, uh, and they were collected in a couple of journals where he, he pasted them in to the journals. And a retired professor at Ramapo College, Dave Freund, who was a photography professor here for many years, um, is a collector of, of artifacts like this. And he purchased them at an estate sale. There are 60 of them that were saved in that journal. And uh, Dave shared them with me. And uh, in about 2011, after he'd seen a couple of pieces that I'd done um, with large choruses, large groups of female choruses, a production of Trojan Women, that I did at Ramapo in 2010, and then a professional production of a piece that I wrote um, called Medea and Medea for Medea uh, that premiered in New York City in 2011. Uh, after seeing those two productions, he approached me with those letters and asked if I might make a performance piece out of them. From there, it took a few years, but um, we eventually did. Um, so the premise of the project is to get those letters out there, to hear those letters um, to hear the voices of these women from 1916, to hear their, their thoughts, their hopes, their fears, their anxieties, um, their sense of themselves um, as they present themselves to a potential husband through a newspaper ad. Kind friend, I saw your advertisement in the Pittsburgh Press, where you would like to correspond with a young lady near your own age or near the same age. I hope you are a good-looking young man, as you say in the advertisement. I am a respectable young lady, have a kind, loving disposition, and would care for you if treated well. I am well-liked by all who meet me, have auburn color hair, blue eyes, and middling fair complexion, and am five feet six inches tall, and strong-built, and very plump and neat. I am very lonely, and like a good home life and a good man. Also, I am very sensible, not foolish or giddy, and great for staying at home. Would like to hear from you soon, and I know you would like me if you met me. Can give you good reference any time from my hometown. Also have good friends around Pittsburgh that know me well. Excuse writing, as I was in a hurry to get the letter in the mail soon. If you have a photo of yourself, would like to see it. Money does not bother me. If I love a man, no difference how much he is worth. I am a very saving girl, too. No spendthrift. I'll be very pleased to hear from you soon. I will close now. Hoping to hear from you. Goodbye. My address is Miss Emma Carr, Foxburg, Clarion County, Pennsylvania, P.O. Box 35. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that process. How do you take a concept like that and then develop it in, into this work that you created? Well, it was a long process. And I think one of the reasons is because, um, for me at least, I felt the responsibility toward the letter writers. Um, they'd already sort of been co-opted by Cauldron himself in collecting the letters which, you know, are private and personal. Um, even though it's a response to a public ad, they're being sent to an individual. And when you read or hear the letters, you know, there are, very, there are vulnerabilities in there that are being expressed. There are, again, hopes and fears. Um, very personal, very real, um, very affecting. Um, and I felt the responsibility to make sure that if I was going to be presenting these or representing them, right, representing them, that I was doing it in a way that felt somehow respectful and validating for those voices. Um, so the process, frankly, took a long time. Um, and there were a lot of people involved because I felt like I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just uh, ideas that were forming inside my head. Um, you know, I'm not a woman. It's not 1916. Um, uh, you know, I don't know what these women were feeling, except as they're expressing them through these words. January 2014, um, I went with my, um, at that point, girlfriend and 
and a woman who became my wife. And part of it was around this trip, which again, there are lots and lots of interesting uh, connections and ironies that have been made through that process as I was meeting someone who eventually became my wife as I was exploring um, these letters. And we actually met through OkCupid, okay which is a form of letter writing as well. So in January 2014, we took a trip to Pittsburgh and went to as many of the addresses as we could find of the origination of those letters and took photographs and video. Again, we weren't interested in finding the women or finding their ancestors or anything like that. That felt intrusive, but just getting a sort of visual landscape and sense of what that space looked like now. And, you know, also, I think then there's some resonance about what it might have looked like 100 years ago. And some of those images were really um, fantastic and some were quite jarring. There were there were addresses that we found, but they were now the entrance to a freeway, right? I mean, if you can think about the kind of infrastructural change that's happened over the past hundred years. In 1916, there were there were barely cars, right? Now Pittsburgh is a modern city with freeways and, right? I mean, so that kind of stuff was kind of jarring. And then also equally jarring was the spaces that were the exact same, right? That still looked like it could be 1916. And that journey that we took, which was a few days of exploration, actually culminated analogous to the way the letters had their journey. Uh, we took a trip from uh, from Pittsburgh to the house where Coldrin lived. Um, we knew the address; it was there in the in the want ad, uh, and we eventually found the house. And um, that was sort of the end of that part of the journey, and also was really the kind of the last piece of the puzzle in terms of putting things together. And we made a video of that final trip. Uh, where we go from um, the place that we were staying in Pittsburgh, driving again down the interstate and getting off the interstate near Brownsville and then taking that trip down the river um, and then eventually finding Cauldron's house uh, at the end of that journey. So we tried to take a trip that was sort of like the trip that the letters would have taken. Yes. That's a fascinating understanding or kind of insight into uh, process for people to understand researching and all of the time it takes to put a project like that together. Tell me, what does the title, where did you get the title of Can't Get There From Here? What does that mean? Uh, well, it means a couple of things. And it also came out of that trip to Pittsburgh. Um, Pittsburgh is a city, if you've ever been there, that has lots of hills and lots of rivers and lots of train tracks. But it's actually a very difficult city to maneuver if you don't know your way around. You know, Google Maps is great, but I had spent months also poring over road maps um, and of the city to like find the different addresses and spaces that wouldn't be available on Google Maps because it's it's limited in terms of what it finds. And we had tracked out paths by car, right, uh, to get you know from one place to the next. And there were times where we were in spaces where we had driven up a, a hill, you know, a road on the side of a hill and gotten to like a cul-de-sac. And it's like, where are we? And how do we get out of here? Right. I mean, literally, there were places where it felt like we had to back the car up. And if you watch the video at the end of the trip to get to Cauldron's house, we went down a, the wrong way, down a one way street. I mean, we didn't know how to get there. Um so that idea was sort of seeded. And then on the drive back to New York uh, from Pittsburgh, we were listening to the radio and this song by R.E.M., I Can't Get There From Here, was playing. And I went, oh, well, that's that's the piece. That's That's the title of the piece, Can't Get There From Here, because we can't insert ourselves into history, right? We can't understand exactly what these women felt experienced exactly what the letters meant to them, but we can imagine it, right? We can imagine what 
it might have been like. And that seemed like a really important concept that also had some real concrete um, foundation in the way that we had processed through the, the making of the piece to that point. I want to shift gears and talk about the process of production on this. You've given us great insight to this point about the creation of the work and all of the research. So now you get ready to take this thing into a production process. And of course, that was done with Ramapo students as your actresses, um, as well as production positions. So talk to us about that and the opportunities of working with our students, how that unfolded. A big part of the process was doing some workshops with um, with young women, primarily young women, mostly Ramapo students. Um, in 2014 and 15, we did several workshops where we played with text, we played with reading the letters, performing the letters, doing movement and gesture as we heard or listened to the letters. The first premiere of the piece happened in May 2016 uh, on the stage of the Sharp Theater. And that semester prior, I had a sabbatical leave to work on this project. And part of my leave was a residency at Mass MoCA, the museum up in Massachusetts in the Berkshires. And I was there for a couple of weeks in April, um, sort of putting together the final details of what the production was going to look like, editing video um, and experimenting with some of the production things that I wanted to use. Um, for example, one of the elements of the show ended up being um, a table with um, a pad of paper and a pen and women sort of taking turns copying uh, the actual letters that um, were there. So that that residency at Mass Mocha was pivotal. But then when I got back at the end of April, I had about a three week period where a lot of work happened. And a lot of students were involved, including an alum, um, Allie Pullen Clark, who uh, works at the Berry Center to this day. Uh, she was actually key in um, helping me both resource and imagine and put together the technical elements of the show, the projection pieces, especially. Um, there, there was a student stage manager, Angie Turo. We had a couple students uh, working with Kristen Worrell to do the sound. There were 60 letters. We had 60 women reading letters. Uh, everyone recorded them and then sent them. And then we put those files together and made um, a, basically an hour long sequence of those letters um, that then played during the process. We weren't seeking out trained actors for that. We wanted people who could read the letters um, sort of sincerely and simply. I actually think that, that is one of the one of the things that makes the the performance of the piece so touching is that these, you know, these letters are being read by people who aren't necessarily actors, right? They're just being read. Um, and that brings a sort of uh, clarity and authenticity to them that I think is um, really touching. So then after you did this premiere at the Sharp, were there other performances of the work done as well? Yes. We actually had two subsequent performances of the piece. One was in Minneapolis as part of a, the a, a festival called the Transformance Festival that took place, uh, I believe, in November of 2016, so about six months after the original production. And for that, I was able to take three Ramapo students uh, to Minneapolis. Uh, and then, because we usually use 12 uh, performers um, for the, the live elements, we found students from the University of Minnesota uh, to fill in. So I had the two or th the three Ramapo students teach the choreography to these University of Minnesota theater and dance students so that we could perform it um, at that festival in Minneapolis, uh, which was really fantastic. And I think a great experience, not just for me, but for the students. Then the third iteration was the next July in um, Newburgh, New York, at a site-specific installation that was curated by a faculty member in visual arts, Jackie Skrinsky, who teaches uh, drawing and painting, but is also a curator. And she invited us to do it as part of a, uh, we took over a whole building and we were on the top floor and we recreated it there with a smaller chorus. It was a smaller space. But again, there was a, at that point, I think two students and an alum who then trained three other performers to do the, the gestures and choreography for the live parts of the performance. So um, students have been involved with it from the very beginning, those first workshops, 
and through its iterations so far and hopefully through further ones because this is a piece that I think has um, great resonance and can be recreated in all sorts of different kinds of venues. And I'm looking forward to recreating it with, with Ramapo students and alum, alumni again. So Samantha, tell us, what was your role and involvement in the project? Uh, my role and involvement in the project was as an actor performer. Um, I was in a version of it at Ramapo and then a version of it in Newburgh, New York. And Amber? I was also an actor performer. Um, I did it at Ramapo and then I did it again with Peter when he invited me and another student to a convention in Minneapolis. Um, so I graduated Ramapo in 2015. Oh, I'm old. Um, and went immediately into grad school at Columbia. Um, and it was a three-year program. Since then, I have been actively pursuing a career in the arts and TV, film, voiceover. Um, out of Showcase, I got representation um, and was auditioning pretty regularly. Uh, before graduation, I actually landed this recurring role on Blue Bloods um, on CBS. And it was supposed to just be one episode um, and then ended up being five. It was supposed to be seven before pandemic. And then I'm also a part of a indie off off Broadway theater company that focuses on new work and devising. Um, it's called Rising Sun Performance Company. For my like income when I'm not working as an artist, I'm a teaching artist, um, and I teach on camera acting, voiceover acting, and cold reading scene studies. I uh, prep kids for the prestigious middle and high schools in New York City. I graduated Ramapo in 2018. The summer of 2018, I did the Commonwealth Shakespeare Apprenticeship, which Sam also happened to do. <laughs> Once I finished that, I decided I do want to go to grad school. So then I did take a year off to just work and save money. And I did Erda's and auditioned for a bunch of schools. I got accepted to the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, I had like three things for the schools I wanted to go to. I decided I didn't want to go to New York since... I wanted an opportunity, not just of professional growth, but like personal growth. And I've been on the East Coast my entire life, especially the Northeast. I wanted a small program. I've always been to small schools. Rambo was small. My high school was small. Uh, and I wanted some, I wanted a program that had people of color on the faculty. So tell us what you learned from working on this project. For me, it was my first introduction to viewpoints and the technique of viewpoints and I think that's the biggest thing I took away with me because I use it so heavily in graduate school. It is a language and a skill set that a group of ensemble artists work together to create. In Viewpoints, they discuss a lot of things like time, duration, space, uh, kinesthetic response, which is when your body just responds to what's going on around you, um, repetition. It starts on a grid, so actors will walk just on a grid floor point and you're you know doing sharp 90 degree turns um and then it layers on top of it itself what i love about it and there are some great moments in rehearsal where something just happens out of nowhere um and someone starts a pattern that then everyone repeats or a sound is made and it's just so you can't ever recreate it it's it's just that feeling of like oh wow we are moving as one even though we are 20 different bodies but also a form of devising with other actor performers where you don't just have a laid out script and set blocking, but we have this kind of amoeba of things that we can do in this palette of gestures and text that we can do whenever we choose to. It kind of just helps us with our instinctual acting, more with listening and more with like trusting ourselves for the right moments. And devised work is heavily a part of the of 21st century theater so a lot of the work that i'm doing now really did start with peter from the first show he cast and directed me in to his suzuki workshops to his viewpoint workshops uh everything that i'm doing now uh, originated with what peter taught me that was also my first taste to viewpoints other than reading the book in school um, so getting it up on its feet was really interesting. Um, one of the things I love about working with Peter is he uses such simple and specific gestural langu language that really carries on throughout the piece and gets you out of your head almost immediately um, so that you are able to listen and respond to the other artists in the room and be fully present because 
without a script, you don't really know what's going to happen on any given moment. And all of us sinking into that simple, specific gestural language allows us to be fully present with each other and listen and respond honestly in any given moment. Um, and that's something that I've tried to carry on with me in all of my work. If I'm having a hard time, I go in into my body first. And that's something that uh, I definitely took away from this project of, okay, what gesture can I connect to this feeling to get me there faster or to get me there honestly? You had two different experiences here because one of you worked on the Newburgh performance and one worked on um, the Minneapolis performance. I'd like you to think back to that time a little bit and talk to me about what it was like to have that opportunity as a student. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sam, but I think the Newburgh performance was more of a per performance. Um, piece and with what I did in Minneapolis it was almost a little more like a live art installation another student and I helped train other students in the gestures and the text that we were doing we had like small 20 minute rehearsals it was definitely interesting being brought along as somebody who already worked on this and okay now you're going to teach this to other people and explain it to them but it was actually very simple and of course that new feeling of doing something you've done before with a new group of people so you get to create even though it is the same piece you get to create a new story in a way with this new energy and you get to respond differently to each other so it's always it's always an experience and samantha what what do you recall of it what was your experience like i remember it being a little bit more performative um and the rehearsals were a little bit more structured um, but I also, for me, a big thing that I'm finding, especially being out of grad school and, and trying to pursue a career in this professionally is that art can happen anywhere. And just because it's not happening where you thought it should, would, could have happened is something that I constantly think about when I think about this project of wow, we just took a group of artists to Newburgh, New York, and we had audience all day. There was like no point where it was quiet. And something that I've taken away from working with Peter is that it doesn't matter if someone loved what you did or hated what you did, as long as you got them talking, you did your job. So tell us a little bit more about your interest in exploring and, you know, how we think about history, both, you know, as, as compared to the present. It's one of the things I'm most interested in as an artist and a scholar. As someone who spends a lot of his time thinking about and working on adaptations of Greek tragedy, uh, I've always been thinking about how we relate to historical art forms and historical expectations and representations. One of the things that, that I try to avoid as an artist is the sort of simple emotional relationship because that tends to psychologize things for ourselves in ways that just make us feel comfortable and familiar. In my opinion, great art doesn't make us comfortable and familiar. Great art makes us feel something that we've never experienced before and that we don't necessarily understand. Um, and even recognizing that we can't understand it could be something that is part of its greatness, right? The, the idea of telling someone's story didn't feel comfortable to me. I wanted to, instead of telling it, making it something that's psychologically similar to something that I understand or that a contemporary audience might understand. Instead, I was more interested in placing those things next to each other, right? So I placed the present, our journey, next to the letters, which had their own journey. Um, the idea of juxtaposition. So the historical exists. The letters in the piece exist. You can read them. You can also hear them being read, right? Uh, they're also being written by performers in the space when it was done in its live iterations. But you know, that's historical. The performers weren't pretending that they were those women. They weren't trying to um, become them. We were trying to allow them to exist and also to allow us to exist in a space where we are observing and experiencing um, the letters in our way. So my explorations of history, whether scholarly or artistic like this one, are really meant to try not to turn it into something that I know and understand, but rather to present it as something to be seen, experienced. And then we all do our, we all make our own narratives anyway, right? Um, to me, it's much more interesting to present these letters and let the audiences hear them and read them and see them 
that's the experience, not me interpreting them for you and telling you what they mean. This 1916 clearly is at the end of the women's suffrage movement in this country. Help us to understand what women's rights looked like and sort of how that unfolds through the, through the letters and the stories that you tell with this project. Well, it's interesting because obviously, you know, it's close to the, the right to vote for women becoming constitutional law, still a few years away. Pittsburgh was already an interesting place in terms of the role of women in society. Pittsburgh at that point was an incredibly successful industrial city and actually had labor shortages to the extent that women were a pretty big part of the workforce. The range of experience, life experience that the women have is really broad. Um, you have letters that are about you know, people having to work every day. And they're not necessarily just secretaries or teachers. Some of them are working in cigar factories. Some of them are working in industrial factories doing the kind of work that we don't, I think usually when we think about history and the place of women at that point in American society, it's sort of unexpected. And a lot of the research that we did was about the specifics of the, the experience of women in and around Pittsburgh during that time. Those things come up in the letters. Um, in ways that don't need further sort of explication and explanation interpretation. And letting them speak for themselves felt like the right thing to do because it really is those voices um, that are coming out that are expressing this, I don't know, this sort of uh, conundrum. It, it felt like there were some things that were on the cusp, but still there was this real um, need to um, find a husband, that that was still a sort of accomplishment or a necessity for a woman in that society uh, to have stability and security. Um, and that's palpable in the letters. Even though many of those women were independent, uh, they were taking care of people, they had jobs that, that, that they earned wages for, as well as taking care of people at home. You know, those are not necessarily just contemporary or modern stories. Those are stories that have existed for a long time. And I think one of the one of the interesting things about the letters as historical documents is that they show that range of women's experiences. Um, these aren't just, you know, housewives or widows, although there are housewives and widows. And it's fascinating how these stories come out and yet they're still... The women are trying to be very discreet. They don't want people to know that they're responding to these to this yes. ad. Oh, uh, yes. that they There's feel a lot of, please don't tell anyone, right? A couple people sent photos, um, but asked for them to be returned. And there are a couple that are incredibly sort of bold and outgoing and interesting, right? Where you see these really creative, powerful uh, voices um, who are, you know, basically saying, I don't care what anybody says about me. Right. And then there are others who are, you know, terrified that someone in their family might find out that this is happening, um, that they've written this letter. So please, you know, send it to this P.O. box. Don't send it to my house. One of the interesting things about this is that Cauldron kept these letters. But as far as we know, he never responded to any of them. So whatever part of his process of of uh, finding a spouse this was. Ultimately, he ended up marrying the girl down the street um, and they remained married for, you know, their entire adult life. Dear sir, as seeing your name and address in the paper, I thought that I would take the chance to write to you as you would like to correspond with a young lady of near the same age as yourself. I'm just 23 years old. I will tell you a little bit of my life. I was just 12 years old when my mother took sick and I was 14 years old when she died. I started to keep house at the age of 12 and I'm still at the same job yet. I'm a good young girl and anybody that lives around me will tell you the same thing. We are living in the same house for 16 years so you might know that everybody knows me on the street that I live on. My father is old and we intend to break up housekeeping and I just hate to think of going to work in a factory because I think that is where so many young girls get ruined, so I'd like to get a nice young man that would make me a nice home, and I would not like to throw my father away as he is old, and he is worth a little sum of money, and he has it all on my name. He is 60 years of age. I do not care for your farm and automobile just so you make me a nice home and make a good husband, not like some of the men do nowadays. I'm not a girl for dances or good time, the only thing that I like to go to is a Nickelodeon or to any kind of a show. 
I do like to go see them. Well, here's my picture. I just had this taken a few weeks ago in my backyard. Send me your answer to this address. I would not like my father to know that I'm doing this because he would worry that I was going to leave him. I have a married brother. I think we'll take him. My address. Miss M. Miller, 21 Ivory Hill Road, North Side, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Please answer soon. I do just want to share how I am grateful for my time at Ramapo. In my experience, it was Ramapo that gave me the confidence to attend grad school and that I would be okay if I went to grad school. From the moment that Peter cast me in my first show, and how I never felt like if I auditioned for something, I wouldn't get it because of my race. I always felt supported by my faculty. That's something, it's something I've been struggling with in grad school because it is a real world issue. It's an issue in the real world and in the field once I leave this educational environment. But I'm thankful that at my time at Ramapo, I was able to perform in all these different roles that I didn't feel, I didn't feel like my race was gonna hinder anything about my about the production or about any artistic values that we had my actor tool belt started at ramapo um and i am so thankful for the faculty what really attracted me to ramapo is that i was getting to be on stage from my first year on through my last year and there were some you know prestigious schools who you are not performing in front of an audience until your third or fourth year as an undergrad and that was not something that interested me um, I learned more from doing it than from, you know, talking about doing it. And Peter is the professor that has stuck by my side. He's my mentor. Um, and I, I love him. I owe him everything. Every time I'm like, I get a little bit of success. I'm like, it's because of Peter. Um, and it, it always boils down to that one person who had that impression on you and who believed in you when you didn't believe in yourself. Taking the experiences that you feel great about, just remembering why you do what you do and what's important to you is just so helpful. Whatever your career path is, is the right one for you. There is no right journey. Whatever is right for you is right for you. And um, Ramapo gave myself and Amber that foundation to just say yes to this crazy wild ride of being a performing artist. <laughs> Dear sir. Dear sir. Dear Sir, Dear Sir, Mr. John D. Coulter, seeing your ad in this evening's press, thought it no harm to write you a few lines. I read your advertisement in Sunday's press, and I am taking the pleasure of answering it. Your ad in today's press interested me. If you are in earnest, I will be glad to correspond giving you a description of myself. I am a widow, 30 years old, and would like to meet you. I am a widow seven years, the 17th of this month, and keeping house for myself, have four fine boys and one girl. I'll just enclose a photo of myself and tell you I am two years older than you. I am rather lonely now as my girlfriend got married last month. I wish to make the acquaintance of a nice home man, one that will like and appreciate a good woman. I think there is nothing nicer than a good, kind man. I certainly do hope you're one of these. Someone full of fun and in for a good time would suit fine. Hoping to hear from you soon. Sincerely yours. Yours respectfully. Thank you to Peter Campbell, Samantha Simone, and Amber Walker for a fascinating conversation. Thanks for watching. Yeah,